Welcome back to Inside Marketing Design. I'm your host, Charlie Marie. I'm the creative director at ConvertKit. And on this show, I'm giving you an in-depth look at the marketing and brand design processes and principles and projects at various different tech companies. And today I'm speaking with Matt Plays, who is the lead brand designer at Help Scout. Help Scout is an all-in-one customer service software platform. And it's a company whose sense of design I've admired for a really long time. So obviously I was very excited to talk to Matt and get the behind the scenes info on how the design process works at Help Scout. There are a little over 100 people on the globally distributed Help Scout team at the moment and Matt's been a part of it for almost three years. We had a really great conversation about the high quality bar the team have set for design and imagery and how they reconcile that with the volume of output needed by a busy marketing team. We also dug in on Matt's latest design project, the new publication In the Works by Help Scout and we got very nerdy and very detailed in some places about components and systems and stuff like that so if you like that sort of thing I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Before we get into it though I want to say a huge thank you to Webflow for sponsoring this season of Inside Marketing Design. Webflow is a tool that allows designers like us to build production ready experiences without coding. It's got a really powerful CMS built in that lets you work with content without dealing with any database management and annoying things like that and that's just one of the many reasons why it's a great option for marketing teams. I use Webflow to build the Inside Marketing Design site and I always highly recommend it to every Every designer for their personal website or portfolio and really to any designer needing an easier way to bring their designs to life on their own. So you can check it out at insidemarketingdesign.co slash webflow. Now let's get into it and hear from Matt about marketing design at Help Scout. Welcome to Inside Marketing Design, Matt. Really excited to have you here because I have been a fan of Help Scout's marketing design for many years. Um, I think I already told you this, but it's one of the websites that I visit when I need inspiration or if I'm like, okay, how do I structure this content on a page? Uh, let me see how Help Scout does it. And I like to reference it. So I'm excited to be digging in today on this with you. <laughs> Well, it's a mutual feeling with you, Charlie, so <laughs> thanks for having me. Um, stoked to be here. Cool. Let's just jump right in then and first talk about the design team structure so that we get a sense of who is working on all this cool design stuff. So tell us a little bit, what does the design org look like at Help Scout? What team are you on? Who do you report to? Give us the lowdown. Totally. So we are, it's funny, we are like a big design team um, when we mm -hmm. think about product and brand for product, we have uh, a director of product design and four product designers mm -hmm. um, on brand. We have a director of brand, three brand designers, three front end developers, a contract illustrator and freelance where necessary. So we come together and keep in touch as a design team at large, but at the same time, we're pretty cross-functional um, brand now actually sits within marketing. So most okay. of our projects, if not the majority of our projects come through um, marketing. We also obviously overlap with product um, when brand finds its way into product as well. So it's kind of cool to sit at that intersection of both and stay in touch with, um, you know, both teams um, and feel kind of allegiance to both teams. So mm. it's cool. And you report to the director of brand um, Correct. and then the director of brand, then does it come into sort of like a wider growth org or a design VP or something? Currently, uh, director of brand reports into, uh, into marketing, I believe, into mm -hmm. the VP of marketing. Yep. Yep. Cool. So, yeah, it's really this brand and marketing collaboration and combination that you've got going on there, which is cool. Totally. All right. And you are now recently promoted to lead brand designer, which is really exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about the responsibilities that you have as, as part of your role? What are you responsible for? Really psyched to be a, a lead brand designer here. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, uh, it's still an individual contributor role. So my mm -hmm. main contributions are still to do uh, brand projects and web design for the company which is what I know uh, where I offer the most value to the company. So I like being here. Um, I think the additional things that I'll focus on is um, creating tooling and processes and you know systems that other designers can leverage to keep our work feeling cohesive, um, make it f and kind of elevate and create equity in the work that we're creating. Besides that, I think it's, it's also just focusing on, on the environment and the processes that make work more efficient and more enjoyable for everybody. Cool. That's exciting to be in that lead role and, you know, be contributing 
in those ways. I love it. So you mentioned brand projects and web designs as the main things that you work on. Um, what about the the wider brand design team? Is there other projects that come in come into it that other designers on the team work on? Totally. Yeah, our our team is actually full of a bunch of really T-shaped individuals. I feel like okay. everybody can do just about anything, but we all have, we go deep in certain areas. Uh-huh. Um, so we have a couple folks on the team who are really good at illustration or, and could be 3D editorial illustration and art directing others who, if we have to outsource, um, I think those individuals can do that really, really well. We've got people who are good at UI and layout. Um, and we've got people like, I, I think I, my where I go deep, I think, is in brand typography, um, photography, and color, and things like that. So it's cool to see that we all have, there is a spectrum of capabilities there, and I feel like that helps us serve all the different areas that our team needs to deliver. Yeah, it makes you like a well-rounded team as well, you know, so there's always someone to specialize in what's ever needed. You mentioned that you feel like a really good um, intersection between product and brand as well, and that you collaborate when needed because you're part of this wider design team. What are some of the ways that you do end up working with the product team and how do you facilitate that connection for collaboration? One really cool instance of us collaborating in recent times is we're actually working on a major feature release at the moment. We had a brief from our product marketers and we kind of were feeling as though we needed to gain a little bit more understanding on the brand design side for us to like create our deliverables. So we actually linked up with the product designer who created the feature and had her join one of our meetings to kind of give us a presentation and just to give us a general understanding of like, what's what's the too long didn't read of this feature. Mm-hmm. So, cause that just really helps us. If we if our comprehensions at that level, then we can distill it and we can make it easy to see at a glance. I think without that bridge, it makes our job really hard. So I think we're probably going to lean in and do more of that. Um, I think it was super successful and just really uh, created clarity for for our whole team. I guess it is a little bit of a spontaneous thing. And we kind of do Mm. encourage that type of pair designing and things that as needed, we can kind of create those spaces, create those conversations. So that way, we just make sure the right people are in the room to create understanding um, and collaborate where necessary. So I think a lot of it is uh, informal like that. The one formal thing that we do right now with the greater design team is we do do a monthly FICA just to make sure there's like kind of this cross pollination of ideas, but really a FICA is usually a fun social time. Um, okay. And I think everything else um, happens just just as needed on a, on a like organic basis, which is pretty cool. Right. So there's not regular, like serious critique times where someone's presenting. It's more like when you notice you need feedback from each other, you'll meet and yep. do it. Is a fika as I know it is like a, is it a Swedish thing? Uh, yeah. that, that it's like an afternoon tea or something? Or right. is it an acronym for something that I'm not understanding? <laughs> no, a fika is as, as I understand it, is like a Swedish coffee date or pastry yep, date. Okay. Yep. Where you, you know, and the idea is, is to usually not talk about work. I mean, sometimes we find you find your way there, but at Help Scout, we, we have even a, a Slack tool that will pair you with a random Help Scouter to uh, suggest that you have a FICA and get to know folks, take the time, especially because we are a remote first organization. So to take the time and do some of that water cooler talk um, mm-hmm. and be social, you know, get to the the person behind the work. So it's a really, really cool thing that we do. I like that. And that is so important. I agree. I don't think we can do our best design work when we don't have all the context. So like you said, wanting to better understand the feature that was being developed and that you were, I assume was creating a landing page or like marketing materials for, and also the people working on them, right? Like those interpersonal relationships are so important, especially in a remote setting. You've got to work extra hard to build them up. 100%. We also do a couple other like, cool things that I think help us passively check in on what other folks are working. Okay. Uh, one thing a lot of the design team does, is we, we maintain these design daily paper docs that where you kind of just record what we're up to. Um, and there we can leave like something that we're proud of, a screenshot of something that we like, a link to Figma, a link to a prototype or a Loom video. A lot of folks, again, since we are remote first, um, 
recording a Loom video to just even just share what you're working on or more formally present a whole phase of a project. I like to share that and I know other designers do and I'll watch others to kind of stay in touch with them even though I haven't chatted with them in months. I feel like I know what folks are up to. That energizes us and uh, it's just a cool way to like passively check in on people who might be in different time zones Mm -hmm. uh, on different teams and you just get to stay in touch in that cool way. I love that you do that. It's a really great way to asynchronously critique or like stay in touch. And side note, spoiler alert, Loom is also going to be featured in an episode in this season of Inside Marketing Design. So everyone stay tuned for that. (laughs) Cool. Um, You also mentioned, so one side of it was connection with product. There's also the connection that you have with the marketing team. What are the main ways that Help Scout markets its product? For the most part, the things that our team ends up working on for product marketing um, is either feature pages um, Mm -hmm. or feature pages on the site, um, potentially a a specific landing page for a a campaign for a feature launch. Um, We also do blog content and things that product specific things that find their way onto the blog, like release notes. So our team oftentimes will help um, kind of bridge the gap between product um, and brand by bringing those and formatting the screens for the blog. And so, um, and simplifying that kind of abstracting it and making sure that it reads well in that context. Mm. So that's kind of some of our main deliverables when bringing kind of the product to market. I love that you called out the like simplifying product screenshots and making, like, there is so much work that can go into a good product screenshot, right? It's more than just take the screenshot, paste the image. There's right. There's so much more to it than that. Um, yeah, it's art, general, not science for sure. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, like sometimes a little bit of like, you know, fakey fake and um, changes going on just to make things easier to see. <laughs> Content I know has always been huge for Help Scout, right? I-, I think I probably heard of the Help Scout blog before I even knew what the Help Scout product was, for example. Talk to me a little bit about that and especially the way that you all invest in imagery and design for content. Because for me, that's part of my job where I'm like, oh God, okay, making an image for a blog post is not my favorite thing to do. Would rather avoid it if possible. In fact, I hire a freelancer to do it most of the time. But how do you all approach that? And talk to me about your illustration approach. I think a lot of this has happened happened well before I joined the company and I kind of mm-hmm. came in and, and joined largely because this uh, mm-hmm. you know atmosphere existed at the company. Yeah. At Help Scout, its brand is seen as a differentiator. So we have permission to invest in things like that, which is really, really cool. So we've already had a high bar for editorial visuals um, on the blog when I joined and we hired people accordingly who can either deliver on that themselves or can outsource and art direct other people as well. I think we see it as an opportunity to extend the concept of the piece and kind of bring that to life Mm -hmm. in a visual way. And ultimately, now that we've kind of invested in this route, we kind of make sure that we uh, can kind of uphold the standard that we've Mm. set for things. And we also find ways where possible to create systems that make us more efficient um, so we definitely do try to uh, prioritize certain posts that that warrant a freelance illustrator versus something that's done in-house uh, right. using a house style or something that's a little bit lighter lift and systematic. So there is this cool spectrum um, in this like editorial content space. Um, and we just have permission to kind of invest in it and and make sure that it it's, you know, at a at a reasonable bar across the board. It's really, really cool. And I think the organization has our back to do it. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. And I think it comes through right in the Help Scout brand. How do you decide which pieces get the, you know, the freelance treatment versus the in-house treatment? Is it ones that are around certain like cornerstone topics or that are expected to reach more people? I don't know. What's what's your thinking there. I feel like that's a conversation usually for the editorial lead of the content outlet and the Mm -hmm. art director who's on the case. I do think there is this this idea of like what is a utility post and and Mm. serves more of a you know a certain purpose and what what we do expect to have some reach. Um, And so I do think there's uh, you know a scale that can be tipped in either direction to decide how much effort goes in. There's there is sort of a tiering treatment and system so that's a little bit outside of my realm. I get to see it from from afar, but 
I do know we have that degree of sophistication. Mm -hmm. Folks do it in a way that sort of gives us the the right amount of effort uh, and Mm. the right amount of ROI for the effort that goes in. Yeah, because that's so important too. This is the reality that you can't make everything the special favorite child or whatever you want to call it. You've got to play favorites at times and you've got to like, I don't know, treat some things as more important than others because otherwise you'll burn yourself out trying to complete everything to like the ultimate high standard. Right, if everything's volume 10, nothing's volume 10. Mm -hmm. That is a great point. (laughs) And nothing can be volume 11 either because you're putting all your effort into everything being volume 10. (laughs) Right, yep. (laughs) Well, okay, now that we're speaking about content and about the importance of it for Help Scout, can we dig in a little bit into In The Works, which is a recent project that you shipped and it is beautiful. This is one of those designs that just like, quite honestly, Matt, it made me jealous. I was like, man, I want to be doing stuff as cool as this. This looks amazing. Like it really pushes me to, you know, up my design skills as well. So I appreciate seeing work like this. Give us the lowdown on what it is and talk about where it started, why Help Scout wanted to do it. This is, it was a huge project and it was a huge gift to me as a designer to have sort of this blank slate and our, mm. our whole team as well, this whole um, blank slate opportunity. There's so much legacy that you have with an existing brand to, to start anew um, is a real gift and you get to try some cool things. But I think the reason we got this going again speaks to uh, the fact that the organization from top to bottom really cares about gen- good, genuine content and wants mm-hmm. to invest in it and knows that that creating it and creating something that resonates with builders and makers and people with this kind of grounded entrepreneurial spirit. Those are the kind of people that like our software. So we want to make content for them and we want, uh, you know, to resonate with them. So I think it's this, it's creating that space where all of that can happen because I do think that ends up being like the intersection of a really cool Venn diagram. Totally. So you had a blank slate, you said, for the brand of this. Was it totally blank? Did you get a brief from anyone of what this site should look like, what the brand should be for In The Works? How much detail? Yeah, nothing's ever totally blank because we we Mm do. I mean, again, we're a remote company, so documentation is paramount. Um, Mm -hmm. So we do have our brand values documented fairly well. Um, And we do actually have an approach for micro brands that cool. aims to make sure that we keep our brand values intact. We might sort of bend and like focus on one of them more than another and lean towards a certain audience or persona more than um, another value. But I do think we ultimately try to keep that in mind as our like North Star or set of North Stars and make sure we never violate them with anything that mm. we do. And I think that ends up making things that feel like great offshoots of the Help Scout brand, but but never something that feels totally different or alien. So I think that's that kind of just the fact that we have those principles and have something to kind of compare ourselves against just keeps us in the in the right zone of like brand to micro brand. We stay adjacent. We never feel different. I love that. What? How much can you share with us about what those values are and what the the guidelines are? You said for micro brands, definitely keen to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know how much the micro brand documentation is uh, public, but you know our brand values are on style.helpscout.com. So mm-hmm. uh, you know we're human and organic, trustworthy, helpful, um, and things like that. And and that that was actually one of the first projects that me and my season of of being here at help scout our team worked on was kind of documenting our you know brand values and some of the uh other voice and tone and brand asset things that you see on style that help scout but that has informed so much of the rest of the work that we've done as we've grown since that day in a really really cool way so it's cool to have that foundation to build everything else on top of and it does help to have some constraints right because i don't know about you but a complete blank slate is a little bit i get it overwhelmed by it let's just say that (laughs) absolutely having that reference point gives us uh, a way to show like all right how what if we pivot by a few degrees from that like what does Mm. that look like what does that look like when uh, through the lens of this new uh, audience or persona that we're we're looking to resonate with, like how can we how can we bend it? And I think at least having that reference point keeps us from uh, just creating something random. 
Yeah, totally. That's a really good point. But I guess something like trustworthy can mean something different to different audiences. So that's interesting what you said of like, you know, you think about the audience and what that brand value means to them and try and reflect that in the design. Yep. Yeah, it does. It helps us have that additional layer. And I do think we one of the first things that we did, we did some discovery early on, but we did hire an editorial lead for In the Works. And yep. she had a vision. Some of the first exercises that we did were in regards to brand values of In the Works, and then also down the line to naming exercises. And that was team wide. So if you were a writer, producer, designer, engineer, you were in that call participating in that meeting. And I think that really helped us also set this foundation for the values of the brand and how that might manifest visually. And then later, like actually naming this thing first or whilst creating the brand direction really helps because you start to see it does it does that match? Does that feel mm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge part of of the process. So when we got into doing our, our brand direction, we did kind of four rounds of it. We were probably playing with only three or four names um, and creating uh, visual directions with those names. Um, and I, I believe uh, maybe a few alternates in there, but I believe we had our, we have our visual direction and the name in one of those like first four directions that found wow. its way and was refined all the way to, to what you see now. That's cool. You were onto a winner right from the start. <laughs> Close. It had a little little bit of dust to, to work through. but To brush off the, the corners, yeah. Yes. Um, I like that you had a meeting with the whole team to talk about this too, because that again just shows me the value that Help Scout places on this project, right? Like if it's worthwhile enough for the wider team to be talking about it, that means it's important and it's not something just like the brand teams doing off in the corner over here and working on by themselves. <laughs> right, yeah. We had a, a Slack group and a, a regular... We, weekly and sometimes twice a week meeting with this core team. And they were all considered stakeholders of this project. Um, so anything that we came to the table with um, from a design perspective was was viewed by this whole team. And I think that ended up, they were true partners throughout the process. Uh, so I think that's yielded a, a final result that everyone's really psyched on. And uh, I think everybody has a little piece of too. So mm, it's super, that's cool. super cool. I was just going to ask you, well, who were the stakeholders in the project? So there we go. You just answered that question for me. Yeah. Let's move on then to the end of the design process of In The Works. How you've got a finished design. How do you bring it to life? Who codes it? And what does that process look like? Again, we had this opportunity, blank slate. We get to try to a few different things in this in this project. One thing that we did in In The Works that I think is, is cool and we'll, we'll certainly do again is we brought devs in much sooner in the ideation mm. phase. We actually had a few sessions where we were just bringing in reference material together. And we even had a, a board in Figma where we called them moonshots. And we just put a bunch of sticky notes. And I really enjoy like when you have a blank slate to try to create opportunities for things you want to see. And sneak something cool into <laughs> um, the project. Because I think that's that's where the, the fun is and that's stuff creates the light um, in the end result. So we actually created moonshots and de developers and designers were all creating them. And I think probably 80 to 90% of those were uh, implemented on the site. Um, in a, and wow. like, I don't know that they would have been if we didn't kind of conceive of them together. Because nobody, those are the kind of things that nobody asks you to do. Like the selected state or that we want the audio player to be persistent throughout um, the experience when we're talking about podcasts and listening posts. Those are things that we thought would be really cool that might not come through in a brief, that might not come through as a requirement, but I think add up to something cool in the end. So it was really cool that we got to do that. And then throughout the process, I think we, we again, since the developers were just as much a stakeholder as the VP of marketing, they would see every step of the way as we mm -hmm. built out components um, in Figma. And much of this was the overlap they were building while we were designing. Um, and eventually we reviewed things kind of component by component, you know, chipped away at that list, which at times my hopper of 
PRs to review was huge at times. Uh, devs hopper of things to build was huge, but we kind of worked through it. And uh, in a few phases of like design and, and building, we got it done. And you, you've mentioned some plurals in here when you talk about devs and we working on it. Sure. Who was actually involved in designing and developing? How many people were working on those parts of it? Yeah. So for, for like the website design, I would say there were about three, three designers working on web design itself. Yep. And we have, um, three developers as well. We had our team when we started the project in March had one developer um, and we lucked out and hired two other front end developers who were amazing, who joined halfway through this project and really helped us carry it through to the end. Our first friend developer actually went on parental leave and the handoff was literally on the same day. They wow. never saw each other in office. <laughs> so it was a really cool opportunity to uh, you know, onboard them and start like with a really, really cool project that, you know, we, we lucked out that they really enjoyed the process and it kind of held us designers to a really high standard to make sure too, that we were doing all the documentation that we could mm. to, to make sure that that was, um, as seamless as possible, but it was really, really cool. And I, the fact that we have three developers, uh, on the end of it at the end of it is, is really cool. Yes. I'm very jealous about that. That's for sure. <laughs> um, how, do, how do you decide between the designers who works on what? That's something I'm really curious about when you're working on this one project, how did you split it up? Yeah, that's a great one. And it's something that I, I feel like I had to anticipate some of the things that might go wrong, mm -hmm. um, in this process and what might make you know, at the tail end of it, when we're building this, like what might make that more complicated than it needs to be. So we front loaded this project with a lot of design system work. Um, so as soon as we uh, got our brand direction approved, we started uh, creating a design system in, and library in Figma. Another really useful tool, it's kind of a totally in the weeds thing. So I hope the audience is ready for it. We're ready but for one, in the weeds. This is the point of the show. Go for it. <laughs> one uh, really cool component that I I worked on um, was just this spacing unit um, mm -hmm. component. So I wanted to standardize our, our spacing throughout the project. So that way we could just stay consistent and not have to juggle values mentally or have them documented. We were actually using a component. And so the component has so many wild variants. I found this old blog post by um, a studio called The Scenery and they were somewhere out in the Midwest and they talked about using the Fibonacci sequence for their spacing units. So it would be uh, the two preceding units equal the next. So oh, if yep, yep. one is 10, the next is 20, uh, the, the following one is 30, the following one is 50, you know, and so on. What that ends up doing is it creates like meaningful gaps between them. And I found that makes decision-making easier. One hmm. spacing unit, when you're talking 160 versus 100, one is right, one is wrong. Right. Uh, those are big differences. You can easily tell like what is the appropriate thing to do. So we did that as our base um, for sort of a desktop viewport. And we actually then multiply that by a ratio. This is where I kind of added to that idea. On mobile, we halved that. So mm -hmm. those units were halved. And on extra large screens, those were multiplied by a factor of like 1.25. And what that enabled us to do is, is basically we had these, these checkpoints where pixel values are super round and we can create comps for them. But ultimately we created a set of variables that developers used in, uh, in code as CSS variables that we were able to just really reference semantically. So we could say like, this is a medium, this this like mm -hmm. this grid has medium gaps. The padding of this section is large. Like, and we got to be really, really consistent with that. It was a lot of front end work. But I think what that ended up doing was it gave us all the same pieces to work with. So we're creating components with auto layout, zero spacing, and we're literally using these spacers in our auto layouts. There's a toggle. If you want to toggle them on for visibility or off, you can do that as well, which is kind of cool. But that enabled us all to stay in sync. And then it made delegating components. Hmm really, really easy to do. So once all that foundation was set, I felt like it was easy to say, Hey, like take this whole page or take this 
this whole section and component and, and work on it in isolation. And it's going to, because it's referencing type styles of, from the system and spacing units, it's going to look like it came from the same desk. And it's going to um, fit in, even if you're not doing it, designing it in the context of the other stuff, because you're all pulling correct. from the same language. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, if things needed to change, they could change globally, because they certainly did. You'd be, we'd be wrong about a ton of things, but then you could change mm. something and it would affect, it wouldn't create outliers. It would actually keep things more consistent. And so we lucked out by putting in that little bit of extra work um, up front. And I think that enabled us to, to spread the wealth because there's so much work to go around and we couldn't have done it without the whole team working on it. Um, and I think everybody enjoyed uh, that part of it. It was cool. Yeah, it's it's fun too as an in-house designer to take a break from the main brand for a little bit and go work on the, a sub-brand like this and a new design system. I love that you got the opportunity to do that. And also it is very clear from hearing you talk about it, why the design ended up so good because of all this attention to the details, right? So I hope that's the takeaway for anyone listening. I know I certainly don't think in systems for my spacing. And so maybe that's what I got to work on if I want my designs to look as good as in the works, you know? <laughs> I think it's the fact that we had this blank slate that we could do it. It's yeah. the fact that we've, we've wanted it for so long, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it's hard to implement, you know? So it, it's cool to just seize that opportunity. I am a hundred percent sure you could do it. Um, and <laughs> thank you, thank there's you. <laughs> also, there's also a total dark side of that coin where you do too much of that. You do have yeah, to like take the step back and look to be sure that just cause it's a system doesn't guarantee that it, that it looks good. So you do have to like take it with that grain of salt. I think having that self-awareness also helps uh, audit whether, whether the decisions you're making, um, are good or not. True. Do you think you'll be wanting to take some of these learnings and ways you approached in the works over to the main help scout brand now that you've had that experience? I would love to, and we've already begun talking about the things that we'd like to take over. I think some of the, the variables that we created that work across viewports really lessened the amount of review that would need to go into um, each component. Um, because ultimately, when those variables work out of the box, it's really nice that we don't need to look at type sizes as much on small screens or mm. the spacing. The spacing doesn't become too much on a small screen because that variable already considers it and already tends to it. Yeah. Um, so we would love to bring some of that back because as we get back into Help Scout projects, some of those things don't exist and we're already feeling we would love for those things to exist. Yeah. So I, I do think, you know, we have sort of another moonshot to kind of bring some of the good stuff back for sure. Cool. And maybe that's like part of your role now, you know, as, as lead brand designer too, to be working on those things. Totally. Yeah. And, and having, so our Mark, our, our first front developer uh, did just come back from paternity and uh, we're super psyched to have him back. And we're now beginning to kind of divvy up the, the new documentation that we want to do, the things that we want to bring back. And uh, I think now we have the, the sort of the time to, to implement and consider what's, what's, worth prioritizing. So it'd be really cool. That's awesome. So now that In The Works is out there and launched, I really want to talk about success metrics and how you measure the success of a project, what sort of metrics you're responsible for as a designer, and maybe we can use In The Works as an example. You shipped it. What was success for In The Works? What sort of things were you looking for? You don't have to share numbers if you don't want. We just want to hear what sort of things, what metrics you're paying attention to. What are you measuring? So when we get a brief for a project, every brief comes in with an ARPA, which kind of identifies who's responsible or accountable, responsible, a participant, and an advisor. It's a okay, fun acronym cool. that yeah. kind of creates those roles and responsibilities for a project. Um, and we also identify like kind of the, the metrics and the goal posts that we're looking for. For In The Works and any project that we do, we usually have, um, it usually funnels up to an OKR. Um, mm -hmm. So in the works is of one that that spans several quarters. So um, kind of creation of the the brand and the art direction rolled up into one quarter's OKR, um, yep. and then the creation of like issue one and the website it kind of rolled up into the second uh, quarter's OKR. Within that, we we have other you know goalposts and metrics that the team is after, but we have 
you know, design is a participant in that process. So for every brief that we get, we have an ARPA, which kind of assigns uh, roles and responsibilities for the project. And I think design is usually in that participant and responsible mm. um, level. Yep. Um, so we do what we can to um, deliver on the strategy to achieve those goals um, as best we can. Um, for In the Works, we were focusing quite a bit, I mean, quite a bit on brand affinity and awareness and, and viewership, um, as well as subscriptions. So those are the things that we're really keen on getting people, um, you know, at the, on the site, um, subscribing to get updates and co continuing to make that. Uh, process easy for our content team to kind of keep that train rolling. That's kind of how we roll into it. So we, I feel like we are never directly responsible for, for those metrics, but we feel a hundred percent indirectly responsible and like as huge partners in that process. And that informs so much of our work. Right. So it's like you personally as a designer or in the others aren't, you know, held accountable to these affinity awareness sign up goals, but you're responsible for helping, I assume it's marketing and like the content team were the ones accountable for it. You're Correct. responsible for helping make that happen. Absolutely, yep. And the affinity and awareness you talked about, this is something that we try to measure as well. And it's so hard to measure. And is, is sign ups one of the way you measure that or is there other ways you measure affinity and awareness? Ooh, that's that's a good question. I know, you know, subscriptions definitely are a cool way to to measure that. We do have folks who are, are tracking engagement across other channels and social yep. and things like that. Some of it does seem to be anecdotal as well. Like we are yeah. we are okay with doing some things as this as this brand play. We know that uh, it is a, a long term investment to invest a lot of effort into creating such a thing, and we know that this will you know. Building it will and creating good content will kind of attract the right folks yeah. to the editorial outlet. So I'm sure there's plenty else that I'm leaving out, but those are the things that I do know. And I do know that some of it is just because we do value brands so much here. So it's kind of an investment we have permission to uh, kind of make. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a I think that's a good approach to it because sometimes we can get a bit too bogged down in the numbers and in doing things just for the numbers. And some things are more anecdotal, you know, things like just people enjoying what you do and shouting it on a social media or something like that. So yeah, that's good to hear about. You mentioned before that this was a project that took two quarters to work on. How much of your time during those two quarters was spent focused on this project versus other things? This was our team's priority for for those two quarters, which was a total luxury and a total gift to us. Um, it was also a fairly accelerated uh, project to do in just two quarters, mm -hmm. um, but we were given, um, you know, permission to focus mostly on this. If I had to guess um, a number, it would be, you know, in the 80 to 90% range of our, our time was spent doing that and other things, keeping the lights on tasks would happen in tandem. But we did want to make this a, a huge um, investment of, for our team. And we've kind of crafted a team around in the works. You know, we've hired an editorial lead who's hired writers, who's hired uh, producers to create um, podcast and visual content. So we, we definitely focused a lot of our time on that and, and we'll split it um, in quarters to come. Now that we've created this, um, you know, outlet that is a little, it is built on CMS. So it is more self-serve now than ever. Mm -hmm. It obviously that took a lot of work and a, t a lot of forethought to get it here, but ultimately it's going to be a lot more of a maintenance property and um, something that content and marketing can maintain themselves, which would be really, really cool. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about iteration, I guess, because that's a big part of our jobs as in-house designers, you know, um, so perhaps more on the, the main Help Scout site. How do you iterate on that? Do you look at the conversion rate of the site and is someone coming up with ideas of like what to change to improve their, how does that sort of thing work? Yeah, it, we're entering a really cool season where we're testing is becoming more prominent. Historically, we've done a lot. A lot of our work would be done on a page by page basis. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd focus on the entire page and the performance of an entire page. We're starting to get a little bit more granular where we're actually testing things on a much more micro level. And we're actually just about to kind of work on a project where we start thinking about and testing um, from strategy, like strategy to design and development 
uh, on like sections, on components, on really individual things. So that way we can kind of dial things in a little bit more incrementally. Because doing cool. things on the full page level, A, you're not getting to isolation as well as you could. You can't really isolate if, which change is affecting um, the metric uh, positively or negatively. And B, the turnaround time, the feedback loop is much slower. It takes longer to do that. So we think, and we're pretty energized that like taking a more micro view is going to help us uh, be a little bit more iterative and a little bit quicker to knowing what's working. I love that approach. And as you do this, as you ship test, is it, um, do you have someone on your team whose role it is to work on data and like feed that data back to you so that you get an idea of how your design is performing? Yeah, we definitely have folks who kind of have their fingers on the pulse of, of how things are working. We have folks um, on growth marketing, in operate marketing operations, um, in SEO, who all kind of come together and sort of create this little cross-functional pod to, uh, you know, propose tests and then kind of deliver that to design um, to partner on how that test might come to life. And then we build that as well together. So it is so collaborative. We also like solicit testing ideas pretty widely as well. Um, cool. I think a lot of it comes from that team, that pod that I described, but also, uh, you know, we solicit from the marketing organization or, or, or beyond. You can submit something in Slack um, with a certain command that'll actually migrate Ooh, it to a board um, that'll kind of track, you know, kind of our backlog of testing ideas. So it's, it's really cool. And it's something we're eager to dig into. And I think it's going to be a, cool, a big part of this, this next season uh, yeah. of work. And it sounds like it really aligns too with you wanting to, you know, improve the design system that you have in Figma to make things more efficient. If you're just focusing on components at a time, that makes yep. a lot of sense. <laughs> well, it's, I find that we create a lot more outliers um, and bespoke pages when you when that's the way um, those projects come in. Hmm. Um, whereas when we start to think about things on a component basis, I'm compelled to think about how will this work here and elsewhere. And I think that reframe is going to really help us gain efficiency um, down the line. Because when the page comes in, you, you have like that feels like the deliverables, you might create a, a, a weird variant here because that's that's what served this or that. It's useful, I think, to start to think about like, how can this be flexible and how can this serve other pages and how can we use this down the line? When you know changes are innate and will have to happen, it's actually easier to account for them. Whereas I think earlier, the other the other approach, I think, takes a static batch of content and, and makes it look good. When you know that there's going to be flexibility, there's going to be testing and changes. You bake that into the idea, it becomes a, a more useful component. I love that. That is really good like advice and like a reason to think about things that way, for sure. Let's end now by talking about what you're most proud of. It could be a project, it could be a certain impact you've had at Help Scout, it could be in the works that we've just been talking about. But let us know what you're most proud of in your time at Help Scout. Yeah, in the works is certainly up there. I feel like mm -hmm. it's at the intersection of all of our team's uh, strengths. Um, we didn't talk as much about visual uh, and editorial art for In the Works, but it, that was another component where I, I saw our team kind of rally and um, find, find ways to create um, volume posts, solicit art from uh, like editorial illustrators externally and art direct those people and create kind of a new sh a shifted um, kind of tone of what our editorial illustration looks like that plus what we got to do with dev and design and kind of up our our processes there was huge and i feel like it, it made that project really stand out for me but otherwise i think back to some of the things that we've done some of just like the cultural pages that we've done, the about page, the careers page, those are kind of companion, a companion piece. Those were really enjoyable to do. And I really got a kick out of doing our DEI dashboard, which was another cool um, interactive uh, project at Help Scout and a cool way to show, you know, how, how much this brand cares about diversity and inclusion. We're willing to be transparent when we know we have a 
ton of uh, room to grow in that area, mm -hmm. but we're going to share that data, show how we've been tracking and kind of um, document like where we'd like to go um, because we just know that diverse teams perform better and uh, having more perspectives in the room just gives us a better chance of solving ideas and making sure that we're solving ideas that, that work for, for people of different backgrounds. Um, so it's really, really cool. So I really love that project. And that was another one that I think our team got to dig in and, and try some moonshots that uh, really kind of made a, a better end result. It's cool. I love that. Well, thanks for all of the detail and all of the in the weeds that you shared with us, Matt. This has been fascinating for me and I'm sure for our audience as well. And I definitely feel inspired to go and try some moonshots now. So thanks for everything that you shared. Thank you. Appreciate it for sure. Wow. So I know we got really into the weeds in some parts of this episode, but I hope you enjoyed hearing those details from Matt as much as I did. I honestly often end up making changes to my process or trying new things or at least just like seeing something in a different light as a result of these interviews. And I hope I'm not the only one. So I would love to hear about your takeaways. Please feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube video or tag me on social media with your thoughts. I am at Charlie Prangley on both Twitter and Instagram. Something that really stuck out to me in hearing Matt talk about in the works and all of the resources and the thoughtful consideration that went into that project is that when we allow time to explore and to try different paths as part of the design process, really great things can happen. And I hope that getting insights into Help Scout's process and like the team that was involved with that can give you some ammo to push for the time you need on your next project to make something truly wonderful because it is worth taking the time for that. If you enjoyed this episode, please firstly, share it with your design friends. I'd very much appreciate that. And secondly, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us get the show out there. Thanks again to Webflow for sponsoring this season and supporting the show. You can try out Webflow's site builder for free at insidemarketingdesign.co slash Webflow. And as an example of a site built in Webflow, you could head to the Inside Marketing Design site where you can find all the other episodes of this show as well as links to Help Scout and to Matt as well. Thanks for listening, everyone, and I will see you next time. Thank you.